The internal responsibility system is in simple essence a conception of the way the enterprise functions. The whole enterprise from top to bottom functions in such a way as to be profitable, productive, and safe and healthy as an integral way of operating enterprise. Nothing more, nothing less. Jim Ham was the ideal I man, and not meaning me, but I in the sense of integrity, intellect, industry, initiative, and involvement. He was instrumental in setting up the uh, Center for Technology and Social Development. Uh, uh, it was really quite a, a, a move for an engineering faculty to employ somebody whose other degree was uh, as, as a sociologist and who would be concerned with the social impact of technology. That was a first. The issues that he explored in this report were not unique to mining. In other words, the, the, the manner in which the responsibility system in Ontario operated, whether it was in mining or industrial or construction, the same issues uh, would have to be faced. Jim Ham's legacy is, is complicated. There he is. A legacy as an engineer and his leadership in that field and his legacy as president of a university. But then there's his leadership in applying all his insights and understanding to the broader social issues. And I would like to say that he demonstrates what real leadership is all about in getting institutions to understand and change. Ham and my husband James Ham um, ran a royal commission in the province of Ontario uh, between 1974 and 1976 on the health and safety of workers in the mines. And this was the beginning of real health and safety legislation in this province. My husband was born in 1920 in the small mid-Ontario town of Kobokonk. Life was very tough in the late 20s in uh, small towns like Kobokonk. There was a photograph of children taken in the school in 1928 before the real decline with the depression in the fall of 29. And some of those children were in rags even then. He went to the University of Toronto as an engineering student in the fall of 1939. When he, he did his master's and his doctorate at MIT and he built a hybrid computer that was part analog and part digital. I mean this was in the very very early days this was in the late 40s and early 50s. After his first year in engineering, he had a job with the Ontario Hydro at Queenston, where all of the power for Ontario was being produced. And he was let down into the generators to clean them out. That was his job. Now, if there was ever a preparation for <laughs> health and safety legislation, I, that's baptism by fire. I often wondered about the difficulties he had. Uh, he often would, if he was ill, if he had a cold, it would go to his chest. And I often wondered how much of that tendency had its roots in that summer job. My husband and I were married in 1955, and we had three children. This is, to my knowledge, the only full-size book that he wrote. It uh, has a lot of insight in it that normally doesn't appear in textbooks. We produced this book largely by teaching a group of engineering science students, and typically we would produce the notes late at night and run them out and distribute them for our lecture in the morning at 10 o'clock. One of the best compliments that we received on this one was from MIT recognizing that this is an undergraduate textbook for first-year students 
and they said this was their best source of questions for PhD oral examinations. We liked that. He and I worked together at one time on producing our own definition of engineering. I pulled it out this morning. Engineering is a profession that serves society by the creation, management, and maintenance of systems, processes, and products to meet human needs. You note know, the emphasis is all on society, human needs. He never really wanted to stop teaching. And when he was asked, you know, what would you like to teach? It was always first year calculus. This is, would bring him into contact with students at a beginning level. He really enjoyed teaching, and people often comment on that later. The Elliot Lake uranium miners went on strike, uh, which caused great pressure on the government of the day, and they called the commission as a result of that. In the uranium mines, uh, the development of lung cancers became apparent, and I think was one of the main reasons why the Ham Commission was formed. He was asked if he would consider running this Royal Commission on Health and Safety, and it took him quite some time to decide whether or not he would do this. He spent the entire month of August sitting on our patio, reading Royal Commissions of every sort, shape, and description. And he decided he had to have some idea what he was getting himself involved in. It wasn't very typical for an engineer to be running royal commissions. Traditionally, it's, you know, it's the job of the judge. Jim and I uh, got involved with uh, uh, the mining companies, the miners, the unions. Um, we traveled, uh, we had hearings across northern uh, Ontario, uh, plus uh, Toronto and Ottawa. Essentially, all of the briefs, I would anticipate, would address the challenge that uh, really the question, are there or aren't there real problems related to the health and safety of the workers in mines that deserve to be given attention that they may not have been given? What we obtained by uh, visiting international leaders was a sense of how their responsibility systems operated how the miner, the management, uh, the training, the inspectorate, and their compensation systems all operated as a, as a, as a unity to uh, lower the risk in their operating workplaces. The central point is that safety is an integral part of all aspects of the, uh, of the operation. That's the simple central idea. It's, it's integrated with issues of profitability and productivity, and then in the way work is organized, the way work is carried out, the way equipment is maintained, the way technological change takes place, all happens with safety and health as an integral part of the consideration. Not as just something that's off on the side from productivity and profitability, but it's integrated, and that's a simple idea. And whether it works or not depends on whether there is that simple conception carried right down through the organization. I, I, and I say carried down through because it has to start at the top and go right down through to the person working under a first line supervisor. His was not the mind of the greedy, narrow self-interest in the hell with others. His was you do, you really do try to achieve. You don't sit back on your rear end. You try to achieve but you do it within the context of yourself and the betterment of community, of the society. I mean, a, a true, a constructive person, he could be a liberal or conservative in that sense, but he believed that each one of us can make an effort to help. We visited different mines, uh, had meetings with uh, union groups, and also with some of the uh, management groups. And each evening we would sit around and discuss the findings of the day. You have to ask, what's, what is the most important thing coming out of a mine? And in his view, it was the miner. Ham saw the miner as being key to the way in which the whole system should operate. He also saw 
that it was very, very important that the risks be identified and, and controlled. And among the factors that determine risk is the role of management and supervision. And he was very critical of the way in which the old mining industry addressed uh, the manner in which they dealt with their miners and the way in which they identified and controlled risks. You cannot deal with health and safety integrally by just having people come in and inspect the place. If there isn't an, uh, a spirit within the place that, that, that represents a commitment to health and safety from the top down, doesn't matter how many inspectors you have, you'll have an unhappy situation. So the inspectorate is complementary to this internal commitment to safety as, a, as an integral factor with productivity and profitability right through the organization. Jim expected other people to perform the way he performed. And you can never quite figure out how you got people to perform that way. That was one of his I guess the weaknesses of all of us is how do you structure something so that you really can get the constructed leadership performance. So he would see a CEO as a huge responsibility to provide real leadership. You can pass legislation, you can establish all kinds of regulations, and they will help, but it's really the leadership at the top that does it. So if you take it down through an organization, if you're running a large corporation, and the senior management abides by the regulations but detests labor, you're not going to have a very smooth system. You have a lot of disruptions, a lot of trouble, and a lot of problems. Whereas if the senior management works with labor to, to put in a policy that they can all support and set up systems of reporting which they all share, you create a totally different kind of dynamic. Boards of directors spend 99% of their time concerned with issues of finance, of profitability, uh, technological investment, capital investment, and, and but, but if, if, if the board doesn't take an active interest in how the enterprise is performing, not just in profitability, not just in productivity, but in health and safety, then the, the, the signals, the, the evidence of a central concern for an integral concern for safety just isn't there. I might also say about Jim Hamm that uh, he was a very good uh, interviewer, very, very polite always, never got irritated by anybody and overall there's no question that he uh, was sympathetic. Going around and speaking with the widows of the victims of uranium problems uh, is a demanding human experience and it was a remarkable one. One of the times we were doing our public hearings we took, a, took an afternoon off and went to visit a, a miner that had uh, been affected by silicosis. And we went to his home and we visited with him. Um, the man uh, could, uh, could only move around with an oxygen bottle. He was in quite uh, desperate straits. And Jim spent a good, good period of time talking with him, trying to find out how he felt and how the compensation system was treating him. Um, it was a very, very moving experience. He had an undying uh, passion and compassion for the, for the concerns and the conditions in which the miners operated. My one piece of advice is that the top people have to grasp the idea, be committed to it, and let the organization know what their, their, their intent is. And I firmly believe that if you look at the relative health and safety performance of different enterprises, whether they're unionized or not, you will find that the best ones, the ones where it's safest to work, also are the most productive and the most profitable. His report goes into depth about what should be done with respect to measurements, to ventilation, to exposure of the people, to dust control, lots of these different terms of threshold limit values, uh, come up to, with regard to silicosis. No, he was a, an engineer who uh, looked at that side of it and left some of us look at the legal or the medical side. He was the one that edited and wrote the total report 
And if one looks at that report and sees a number of references, you'll know how deeply he was concerned about the engineering side of it as well as the health side. And we were all very proud of him when he uh, came up with a formula that was acceptable to government, uh, labor, industry. The overall findings had bearing on the way in which the government had to address health and safety. There would no longer be a mining act and a construction act and an industrial act. And then all the other parts that weren't covered by a particular piece of legislation. So they had one, one act that covered everything, that gave everybody a consistent set of uh, responsibilities, a consistent set of uh, duties and rights and obligations. And we had an inspectorate that was under one uh, leadership of the Minister of Labor. Jim was an extraordinarily intelligent human being who never got caught in the narrowness of bureaucratic structures in the way he thought about things. And also wasn't trapped by any particular ideology, right wing or left wing. And he indeed suggested that some very concrete things should be done whereby labor and management would talk with each other about this and some of the expertise that talks about how the work site affects health could be brought to bear on it. And eventually that could affect the compensation system. Part of the fact that the government called the commission is that uh, the workers have been unhappy, the unions have been unhappy, I think there's been legitimate public concern about this, and, and so I don't think the question is whether or not, say, the mine inspection branch, if it hasn't been, can be more person-oriented. I would simply say that it has to be. If it hasn't been, then it has to be. Uh, and I really feel strongly on that. I think he spent a lot of time trying to educate the media to understand what the problem was. I mean, I can remember being in, in um, media conferences, you know, just standing back in the corner and watching him operate. It was almost the professor in the classroom teaching the students, you know. And if you students would just sit down and listen a little bit, we could make some progress here. But the media wants something to put on the front page or in the headline very rapidly. They want it pre-digested and um, you just give it to us and then we'll do what we want with it and put it in the newspaper. There were subsequent hearings uh, that were held around the province which gave rise to, in 1978, uh, uh, to the Occupational Health and Safety Act. One of the things that was unusual, royal commissions have this, I think, sometimes unjustified uh, reputation of, oh yes, we've had a royal commission, we've put it on the shelf and that's it. Now, that is not what happened here. There was a real change. There was some legislation formulated and a change had occurred here in people's attitudes generally, including the government. When uh, Jim Ham took over the presidency, he, he was reluctant in accepting uh, the, this position. I think he knew the university very well by this time and knew the, the great difficulties that any president would have in operating this university as chief executive officer. He took it on as a matter, I think, of duty and responsibility to the community. He was accepted by essentially all facets of the university as being an ideal person for it. Uh, and that, as I say, is unusual for someone coming from an engineering background. It was always a very collegial approach. He would bring his deans together and bring uh, all of the administrators together. And uh, we had real debates about what uh, went on. Certainly not an autocrat. So his monument is not a building around the university, it's much more the integration of these disciplines. In the Ontario Science Centre, they are interested in how things work. Well, I've been spinning and weaving for many years, and a group of us went in there 
uh, to learn to operate the loom. I mean, we were all good hand weavers, but we didn't have any idea how to operate a jacquard loom, and we basically had to teach ourselves. And I was shocked to discover that the Ontario Science Centre had no idea how that, that display worked. Well, I came home in outrage and announced to my husband that um, I wasn't leaving that project till we had something written down. Another weaver and I sat down and began to write some of this. And my husband was thoroughly and totally displeased with what we had done. And he said, well, I'll do it for you. My husband had been retired for a number of years and was clearly not very well, but he took on this job of writing this manual for the Science Center. He knew it was something I wanted. So then he wrote a 25-page manual on how that loom works. Now, it is very much a manual written by an engineer. It's clearly not written by a weaver, uh, but it does explain how that loom works. It also interested him from a health and safety point of view because clearly Weaver's Bottom was, a, was an occupational disease. I mean, you rocked on that loom and you had Weaver's Bottom and it was hard on the hips. The loom, we have reason to believe, dates to about 1840 or 45. It is the only operating jacquard loom of its age in any public institution in North America. And I know that the Smithsonian would give their eye teeth to have that, and that loom, I hope, will never leave Canada. Ham had a systems view of health and safety with uh, responsibilities and rights uh, set out in law along with uh, a unified inspectorate and I think that if you uh, look at the Health and Safety Act and the way in which the inspectorate is structured today you'll find that uh, it in fact exists as he had hoped it would become. It was surprisingly close to the the contribution that Northrop Fry made to the university something later often quoted pieces taken out of it that said, yes, he managed to find the essence. I used to say to, to Jim Ham that I was a baseball fan and always knew that Ty went to the runner, and I sort of feel that you're a bit like that with the worker. Any question of doubt, you give the benefit of the doubt to the worker. Uh, Ham's greatest contribution would be taking his extraordinary skills and understanding and applying it to tough issues in society facilitating those institutions to come to grips with the changes they must undertake, recognizing those changes are always slow, and it's hard to keep the momentum up once you lose a Jim Ham. My husband was very privileged to receive the Order of Canada in 1980, and then, I guess it was almost 10 years later, that he received the Order of Ontario. I think he felt very privileged but those external things, in a certain sense, were also, they were important to him, but they were not the driving force. Some of my husband's colleagues have said to me that it may well be in the long haul uh, that he will be remembered most for the Royal Commission. These two segregated years in the middle of a 40-year career uh, may well be the thing for which he is, in the long haul, remembered most. And I don't think that would displease him. The essence of it is that wherever anybody works in that organization and whatever responsibilities they have, they're defined carefully enough to integrate responsibility for health and safety right into their working responsibilities and their relationships with other people.